Okay, great. Hi everyone, I'm Quaid. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work today. Uh, the work I'm going to be talking about is joint work. Does my mouse work here? Oh, there's a pointer. Uh, oh, that's a good pointer. All right, uh, it's joint work with uh, the Laboratory of Lincoln Stein, uh, uh, Wei Zhao, Shankar, uh, and Amit. And uh, this work was published uh, earlier this year in, uh, in BMC Bioinformatics, but it, it's a good paper. Don't let the publication venue make you judge it. Um, and then um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I'd like to thank MN for giving such a great introduction to, uh, to this topic. So I'll very quickly go through my introduction, which is probably very similar to his. Um, you know, there's this kind of ubiquitous heterogeneity that people are seeing within tumors. Um, and the, the idea is, uh, sorry, one of the, well, whoa, I've never been nervous in the last five years, and I'm nervous today. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Tony. All right. So <laughs> the, the, the theory for the origin of this heterogeneity goes something like this. All right. So the, the first cell gains, a uh, single cell gains a, some oncogenic mutation that allows it to expand. Its descendants gather, uh, gain further oncogenic mutations that either give them a selective advantage, allow them to evade the immune system or to expand the same. And as time goes on, you build up more and more dis genetically distinct subpopulations within the tumor. And at some point when you take a sample of the tumor, what you're getting is you're getting a sample of all these genetically distinct populations that are in the midst of evolving against your body and against each other. Um, and you want to characterize these, these uh, tumor populations in, in a couple of different ways. First of all, you'd like to understand what the evolution of these, uh, these populations is, is, is a way of understanding how the development of the tumor works. But also these, these subclonal populations, which are genetically distinct, they have varying abilities to invade, metastasize, and resist treatment. So you might, you might want to know actually what the genotypes of these subpopulations are, potentially to choose a drug or a cocktail of, co of drugs, or as a part of predicting prognosis. Okay, so it turns out with, um, as, as Iman has said, with, with high throughput sequencing, often you can, and I, I, I took this picture from his, uh, from his paper because I thought it was a really good one. So I'm going to use it in my talk too. Um, and and it, it turns out that, that with um, the mutation frequencies under some conditions, you can actually reconstruct the entire evolutionary history, but even more importantly, you can also reconstruct the, the genotypes of each one of these, these subclonal populations. Okay, and so the way this works is the following. So you've seen this figure before, so it should be pretty easy to follow. So along that, this is a histogram that Iman made. And so along the bottom, these are the population frequency of the mutation. So this is, this is the proportion of cells within the population that do sample that have the mutation. That's just twice the variant allele frequency. And each one of these clusters of, oh sorry, and then the, the height here is the number of mutations. And each one of these clusters corresponds to a subpopulation that occurs either in the tumor at sample at this particular time or at some point earlier in the history of the tumor sample. Okay? The reason you have multiple mutations instead of just one mutation is when you gain this whatever mutation it is that allows you to expand, you've already accumulated a lot of other passenger mutations. So their mutation frequency in the population increases when the driver mutation uh, frequency increases. Right, that which gives rise to these nice clusters. Okay. What else do I want to say right here on this slide? Um, yeah, and so, so you know, the the first uh, the first cell gains the first mutation, and whatever passenger mutations come along with it, one of its descendants has the initial set of mutations, but gains some further mutation. You have some uh, another descendant here that's gained separate mutations, and then this subpopulation has disappeared because two of its descendants have sort of occupied all the cells that, uh, that it used to contain. Okay, so now we're gonna ignore the fact that we have clusters of population frequency and we're just gonna say these are individual mutations because it's gonna make the explanation a little bit easier. Okay, so, so if you wanna do subclonal inference, and this is just with one sample now, you have to solve this matrix factorization problem. So here you have a vector that's a vector of the mutation frequencies that we were seeing before, right? And then. That vector, you have to explain by a matrix of subpopulation genotypes. So each one of these columns corresponds to one of the subpopulations in the tumor or at some point in the tumor's evolutionary history. And that you have a one if, the, uh, if that subpopulation has a mutation and a zero if it doesn't. Right, so these, these columns are telling you the selection of mutations 
the, the somatic mutations that you've identified that that subpopulation has. And then you multiply this genotype matrix by, uh, by a vector of subpopulation frequencies, and you can see here one of the subpopulations has a frequency of zero. You could, if you wanted to, just actually just remove that subpopulation and just have a vector of three, but I put it in here just, uh, I don't know why I did that, I just did. Okay, and you can certainly solve the same problem when you have multiple samples. And that's you just add another vector of mutation frequencies, you add another vector of subpopulation frequencies, now of course the genotypes aren't changing because you're still, you're still explaining the same set of, uh, of subpopulations. Okay, so now, the, the problem here is that there's too many, often there's too many unknowns on this side compared to the number of observations that you actually have, right? So without making any further assumptions, you need many more samples and subpopulation to have a robust, unique solution to this matrix factorization problem. Okay, so it turns out that by making one single assumption, often, you can recover more subpopulations than there are samples. And then, you know, in some situations, you can recover multiple subpopulations from a single sample. And, and that, that assumption as, um, was one of the assumptions that Emin was making, as he pointed out, it's called the infinite sites assumption. So the idea here is, is that the genome's quite large, right? You have three billion locations that mutations can occur. Only tens of thousands of mutations occur actually in the genome. So, Every, so it's, it, the overlap of mutations is rare enough that you can assay, assume that there's an infinite site of possible mu mutation sites so that every mutation only occurs once in the evolutionary history and it never reverts to normal once it occurs. Okay, so, so from now on, we're going to actually write a phylogeny that corresponds to this, this genotype matrix right here. Okay, and there's a little bit of notation that I'm going to introduce, and I want you to pay careful attention because the notation looks a little bit confusing, but it's really going to help you understand the rest of the talk. Okay, so the mutations I'm going to indicate by these lowercase letters here. Right now, of course, the same mutation can be, uh, can be present in multiple subpopulations because all the descendants of a subpopulation gain all the mutations that, that you originally had. Right, now the subpopulations I'm going to indicate with capital letters and I'm, going to in, and I'm going to label them according to actually the mutation that first appears in that subpopulation, right? So here's in subpopulation B is the first time that the B mutation appears and all the descendants of B of course get the B mutation. Is that clear? So this matrix right here corresponds to this little phylogeny here. These are the subpopulations. Just, for, just to help you, I put the genotypes of the subpopulations down there in terms of the mutations that are occurring. And you know, of course, this, there's another uh, phylogeny that could be constructed in this case from this, this genotype. This is a different genotype. And then this I'm going to call a linear phylogeny because it goes in a line. So A is gained first, then cells that contain A gain B, and then cells that contain A, B contain C, right? This I'm going to call a branching because separate, uh, cells separately contain B, uh, 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 gain B and C, okay? Now, I, I'm going to tell you how this, is, this assumption allows you to do this reconstruction because it, because it limits the, the matrices that are, are, the genotype matrices that are going to be valid. But if you want to do subclonal inference without this assumption, there's a new method that was just published in PLOS Computational Biology called CLOMO. But you really do need a lot of samples in order to get this subclonal inference right. Okay, so what are the implications of the infinite sites assumption? Well, the first implication, which is really important, is that if the frequency of the B mutation is greater than the frequency of the A mutation, the B cannot be a descendant of A. And that's because any, any uh, cell that has, sorry, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah, because if B is a descendant of A, then any cell that contains B also contains A. So the frequency of A has to be at least as high as B. Does that make sense? It's important you understand that. Because that's the, one of the, that's the most important implication. The other one is that all mutations are heterozygous, obviously, because there's, there's two loci and you get both of them. So the mutation population frequency, which is the proportion of cells that have the mutation, is simply twice its variant allele low frequency, assuming you're getting that, perfect, that measurement perfect. Okay. And then if a subpopulation contains a mutation, it must be a descendant of the subpopulation when the mutation first occurred. We've been assuming that all along already. Okay, so it turns out that without any, making any other assumptions besides this, and you know, assuming you're in an area of normal copy number, which we're assuming through this entire talk, is that you can infer a linear phylogy from a single sample. And you can do that using something called the sum rule, which is what we called it, and, and it's because we hadn't fully read a paper that uh, was published a year ago that called it the pigeonhole principle. So I'm gonna give it both names. 
And, and the, 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 the rule goes like this. If subpopulation A is the ancestor of B and C, and you've established that somehow, and you find that the frequency of A is less than the frequency of B plus C, then only a linear phylogeny is consistent with the data. And the reason that is the case is because if A plus B, B uh, if C plus B is greater than A, that means there must be some cells that contain both B and C, right? Because that's, uh, you know, otherwise in this branching phylogeny here, the frequency of B plus the frequency of C has to be less, to, less than or equal to the frequency of A, right? Because there's these cells up here in A that only contain A, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Thanks, Chris. All right. So, so under those circumstances, you can rule out the branching phylogeny. Now, now, it turns out that, you know, um, with one small caveat, which I'll explain in, the second, uh, in a second, um, with a single sample, you cannot unambiguously rule out, uh, rule out a linear phylogeny without making additional assumptions. And I'll tell you what those additional assumptions are in a moment, and I don't actually think those are the right assumptions to make. But however, if you have multiple samples, you can infer a branching phylogeny without making any additional assumptions. And that's because if you, if you do, again, establish that B is the ancestor of B, uh, is A is the ancestor of B and C, and in one sample, the frequency of B is greater than C, and, that, that's, that, and in another sample, B is less than C, then neither B nor C can be the parent of each other, right, because of the infinite sites hypothesis, right? So only a branching phylogeny is, is consistent with that, right, because they have to be on separate branches, right? But you need multiple samples in order to make that assumption. So what happens if you have a single sample? Well, the reason that it requires more assumptions, as, as Iman was pointing out, any decreasing sequence of frequencies, so any frequencies that you give me, I can sort them, and then I can make a linear phylogeny where the population frequency of i, remember that's the population that first gains mutation, little i, is simply equal to the difference of these two uh, uh, subsequent frequencies, and then with the last one equal to that frequency. So you cannot ambiguously infer this, this branching phylogeny. Now there's one exception where point mutations overlap with SMVs that we found, and you can Google Philo WGS for details. This is our new paper where we describe this. But without having overlapping copy number variations and point mutations, you, you can't do it. Right, and so here's an example. So here's a set of three population frequencies, 80%, uh, 60%, and 20%. Now, of course, there's a branching phylogeny that's consistent with that. So uh, this one is 60%, this one's 20%, and this one's 80 minus 60 minus 20, which is zero. But there's also a, a linear phylogeny that's equally consistent with that, right? So, so how is it that you can infer branching with a single sample? We have to make this additional assumption. This, and we're gonna call this the strong parsimony assumption. And this is the assumption that Iman makes, and it's also an assumption that's been previously made in, in this trap paper that appeared last year from um, uh, um, Kluber's lab. And uh, they called it sparsity. But the, the, this assumption is that the correct phylogeny minimizes the number of subpopulations present in the tumor. In other words, it's, it should maximize the number of I for which this, the population frequency is zero. And Iman showed you this picture, right? So if you somehow find a triplet of these population frequencies so that you take the first one, you subtract those two, if this is equal to zero, somehow that's good, right? Now, you know, certainly if you can measure the frequencies precisely and you, you found this, it would be a big surprise, right? And you might think that, that branching is consistent here, but the problem is, is that sequencing noise kills this assumption. Right, so, so if you add one, if you get the frequency of B wrong by one, well now B plus C is greater than A and it's only consistent with linear phylogeny. If you let it go down by one, then B plus C uh, minus A is equal to one. So, so you no longer have this like, special status of this population having disappeared from the tumor sample. Right, so the parsimony no longer holds, you have no way of choosing between the two. So, so the solution that, that both TRAP and BTV use is, is you find all triplets where, where you know, the difference is within some like, small epsilon value that, that is governed by the, sort of the sequencing noise. Right? But now you've lost this sort of magic relationship that you wouldn't expect by chance. 
right? Because now, you know, maybe there could be a, a, a linear phylogeny that, that's consistent with these population frequencies. And certainly, the bigger that you make epsilon, the more likely you just happen to have this surprising relationship that's not actually branching. It is actually a linear phylogeny, right? And the solution, I mean, you know, to state it succinctly, the solution finds triplets that are possible that aren't ruled out by the sequencing data, but it doesn't necessarily find ones that are likely, meaning that there's not another explanation that's more likely. And in order to establish this, you really have to know a lot about how often branching occurs, how often this special status occurs where the subpopulation disappears from the tumor when it used to be there. And, and I'm not sure that that's been, you know, it's, it's been established that that happens very often. And, you know, certainly there's not enough data yet to say anything in particular. So I don't think you should make this assumption. So, so what do we do when we, ha when, we, when we have ambiguous trees? What we do is we honestly report the ambiguity users in what we call a partial order plot. And so say we have two phylogenies that are equally consistent with the data. So we assign both a posterior probability of 0.5. Well, we combine those two phylogenies together. We say, OK, well, in every single phylogeny that's consistent with the data, A is apparent to B. And 50% of the phylogenies A is a parent of C, and 50% of the phylogenies A is a parent of C. Okay, and the nice thing about this is because of the sum rule that allows you to infer the linear phylogenies, if you can get a linear phylogeny in the top of the tree, you can see that that's consistent, and then you can see where the consistency disappears. Okay. So, I mean, then, then we use a generative model to measure the fit of these trees to data, and I'll, I'll briefly tell you about how that generative model works. Um, if you're a connoisseur of this type of thing, this slide contains everything you need to know. And if you're not a connoisseur and you don't care about the technical details, you can just phase out for about 30 seconds. Okay, so we use a weekly informative prior over trees. And we get this from a tree structure stick breaking process. This is a non-parametric prior um, described by Ryan Adams at NIPS in 2010. And then in order to make sure that we're not favoring some trees over other, we integrate over a broad range of parameters of the prior. And so these are some trees that, that we fit to uh, ambiguous data uh, for different setting, settings of the prior, and we integrate over those settings. We use a binomial sequencing noise model. In fact, we, uh, we adapt the, the model used by PyClone. Uh, it's not hard for us to switch to an over-dispersed uh, over binomial, which people think is more, more um, consistent with sequencing data, such as the one uh, described in the new version of PyClone. We use Monte Carlo methods for inference because we have a complex model. We use MCMC to uh, sample from the posterior of our trees, and we have an inner loop of Metropolis Hastings to sample from the posterior of the population frequencies given the tree. And we show all samples. Also, we have the true with the highest di uh, day likelihood, and we actually have software to generate these partial order plots. And we're currently working on better ways of trying to show our uncertainty beside the partial order plots because they, they get kind of ugly, and you'll see what I mean in a second. Okay, so for validation, we ran it on single samples. Now, now this AML data is actually different than the AML data that, um, uh, that MM was talking about. So the gold standard here is actually a, um, a linear phylogeny that's got, that's got three different subpopulations. We recover that with high probability, we, require, we recover that linear phylogeny. We recover, basically assign high probability to three populations. We make one switch. So this is moved down here, and this is moved up there. And that's because the, the, those, that's what the population frequencies are actually consistent with. And we think it might be an, uh, an experimental error, um, but we don't know. And we've also run phylo sub on multiple samples, and this is data from uh, CLL. And this is just showing the variant allele frequency of the mutations over time. Ignore these ones. These are like on the X chromosome, so their variant allele frequency is, is higher than 50, or they're in regions of copy number one. And then these are the, the clusters that we got. And the clusters that we get, as well as the trees that we get, are consistent with the manual analysis of these data. OK, and it's just to show that, you, that when the frequencies cross, we do recover branching. OK, so um, uh, within, within Iman's paper, there's actually a, a plot where they, um, they compare phyla sub to B, uh, BTB. And we get a lot more clusters than BTB on data that was sampled from their model. And I just want to explain why that happened. We don't actually have the data yet to, to see really what went wrong, but we think we know what went wrong. So what was used in those simulations is they used a fixed standard deviation that was independent of variant allele frequency and of read depth. Right? And they used a standard deviation of uh, point, uh, 0.2 for the sequencing noise that you would expect within a cluster of mutations. That's the red. Right? But the right standard deviation to use 
uh, under the binomial model, which is one the sort of the most appropriate model for sequencing noise, uh, depends both on the uh, the read depth, that's the 0.01 here, and also depends on the variant allele frequency. And regardless of the variant allele frequency, it's always less than 0.01. So, so what that means is, and this is this is the uh, the sequencing. So each one of the clusters is actually somewhere between two or ten clusters, depending on the variant allele frequency. Right? There's at least two that fit in here. And so we think that we're actually the ones who are getting the right answer here. Because there's actually more clusters if you use the appropriate uh, model for sequencing noise. So what's the, what's, the, what's the takeaway point? The first one is not all assumptions are equally valid. And you have to be very clear about what assumptions you're making when you're building these trees. And so the infinite sites assumption, it's, it's almost always valid. I mean, there's going to be a, a couple cases where this gets broken, probably because of these birthday type issues. But it, those cases are relatively easy to detect or you can design a model that can ignore some of the, uh, the, some of the mutation frequencies. For the strong parsimony assumption, it really remains to be seen whether or not that's a valid assumption because it depends a lot upon the tumor evolution and how often branching occurs. And I think it's also important to honestly report what your uncertainty is, especially in situations like this, where you might actually be supporting medical decision making. Um, simulated data sample from an incorrect model is not really an appropriate way to compare methods. And, and we have a new version of PhiloSub um, that's, that's available in Archive and BioArchive and is currently in review. And it's the next generation of PhiloSub that incorporates copy number variations. And we don't detect those ourselves, but if someone provides them to us, we can use them. Point mutations, and it can run on uh, whole genome sequencing data even when it doesn't have the copy number variations, just based on mutation frequencies alone. And we're talking about depths uh, between 30 and read depths between 30 and 200. Okay, so I'd like to uh, uh, thank the people who did the work that I described today. The, the work, uh, the development of Phylosub was, uh, you know, both Wei and Shankar were first authors and uh, Amit contributed to the development of the algorithm. Wei is currently at the OICR. He was co-supervised while he was working on this between myself and Lincoln. Uh, Philo WGS uh, was developed by Amit with help from uh, Shankar and uh, there was also contributions from Christina and Gung Ho at the OICR. This work was funded by the Ontario government and by NSERC. And I'm from Toronto, that's the tower that's in Toronto. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hi, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, so my name is Jeremy Coleman from Genomic Health. Uh, the question I want to ask you is actually uh, probably twofold, and it's probably also a little bit too uh, in mind. I didn't get a chance to ask you the question. Okay, I, so, I, I can't hear you when you're sure. not. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the question I have is, uh, have you had a chance to look at the uh, clinical sample so far? So I'm asking this question because in cancer, there's also a question of multifocality. And uh, when you get a sample, sometimes they don't necessarily come from one single uh, parent node. So, I mean, um, for historical reasons, in, in our paper, we, we assumed a, a single uh, foci, or focus, I guess, would be the right uh, <laughs> is the singular, um, but that's, that's actually very easy to change. Mm -hmm. all, all you do is you, you put in mutations that represent wild type that have a variant allele frequency of 0.5. But if you get a data that combine, that comes from two different, uh, two different types of samples, how could you resolve the ambiguity? Well, you, you need multiple samples in that case because it's mm -hmm. branching. <laughs> Right, because you have these two, I mean, if you think about wild type as being the, the founder cancer cell, mm -hmm. and then you have these two here, it's branching. Right. So for the reasons that I described in, in my talk, you're going to need multiple samples in order to resolve that issue. But these two will both be homozygous, though. Is, is, is there a way to build simultaneously two trees from multiple samples? Well, if, if you... Mm -hmm. if you if you, um, uh, yes, for multiple samples there is, because it's just, it's branching. Uh, you, if you have multiple samples, yes, you can do that. Uh, if you have a single sample, we, th we think that the ambiguity still exists. Maybe we should talk about this offline and I can mm -hmm. explain more clearly what I mean. Okay, right. yeah. thanks. Hello, thanks for the talk. I have a, uh, so if I understand, understand well, so when you use multiple sample, you assume that all the samples, more or less, all the patients or all the cancer undergo, underwent to the same uh, type of evolution. So what happened in the case, I think that the, the number of somatic mutation is not normally distributed. So 
Is it the model able actually to capture different level of evolution that you have in the sample? Uh, is like, do, do you need to do some sort of clustering uh, of the sample and select the one that are more or less homogeneous before you use this one? And the last question is, are you using, are you taking in consideration any loss of heterogeneity, uh, sorry, loss of uh, uh, heterozygosity in, in, the, in your algorithm? Um, so, uh, to answer your first question, um, so we're not explicitly making assumptions about the, the number of mutations that, that occur with, uh, that are unique to a subpopulation. Um, that those assumptions are kind of built into the prior that we're using a little bit, and um, uh, hopefully it's not making very strong assumptions about that. But we, we haven't tested it extensively on, on tumors that, that have this type of variability between subpopulations in the number of, of new mutations. Um, uh, to answer your second question, um, I mean, if you want multiple samples from a tumor and you want to do the best that you can at reconstructing the evolutionary history, it's, it's good if they, they vary a lot in, their, in their, the proportion of their subpopulations, right? So if you can get different parts of the tumor, that would be, probably be one of the best things that you could do. Um, the, the last question that you're asking about is loss of heterozygosity, and that's, that's detected in the copy number changes. Right, and so, so you know, if you provide those to us, we can deal with that. Uh, and the new method, Philo WGS, explicitly allows you to in incorporate those types of things. And it also allows you to assign a population frequency to say what proportion of the cells have that copy number change or loss of heterozygosity. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for sharing the talk. Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, do you uh, do anything different for multi allele variants? And uh, the second one is, um, do you see any, um, uh, any um, I mean, I primarily wanted to use your file or WGS for targeted sequencing. Is there any limitation on using those? Uh, for, for some reason, I, I missed important words in both of your two questions. And I can't reconstruct it in my mind. Can you? Oh, can you the first say? one is: uh, Do you see any? Uh, do you deal with multi-allelic variants differently in your? No, we don't. So you just construct the. Just roll them out. This okay. <laughs> Are you throwing them out? <laughs> Throw them out. I mean, you got tens of thousands of, of mutations, right? Throw them out. You you build the evolutionary history and then try to put them back on the evolutionary history because you already have an, an idea what the population the select uh, the set of population frequencies that are valid are. I see. Okay. And uh, do you see any limitations um, on using Philo WGS on targeted panels? On targeted panels, like uh, so, if you have a select set of genes, I mean, does your Philo WGS work on a small set of genes? Does it only work on WGS sequencing? Oh, no, we, we, we just call it WGS because, because it, it can it work on WGS. Okay. I mean, I, in fact, like one of the subroutines is just file sub. It just sped up a little bit. Okay, thanks. Yeah.